So what we're going to talk about is waste anesthetic gases. We're going to talk what exactly they are, uh, the difference between active and passive scavenging, what are the dangers of waste anesthetics to uh, pregnancy, what's the proper way to handle uh, a, an exposure, and how to maintain your machines, what to do it, uh, for day to day. So. WAGs. It stands for Waste Gas Anesthetics. These are the anesthetic vapors that um, come away from your patient, that leak around cuffs, from leaks in the machines, things that are uh, gases that are exhaled from your patient. All of the inhaled anesthetics that we use in private practice are, can cause waste anesthetics or all halogenated hydrocarbons. It's just a fancy way for saying uh, a hydrocarbon is anything that has uh, one um, halogen atom attached to it. Just a fancy way of, of calling them. The, in, the inhalants that are typically used in veterinary medicine are isoflurane, which I'm sure everybody has practice with. How many people have practice with sevoflurane? A couple of you, good portion. Uh, anybody work with desflurane? It's one of the newer up and coming ones. It is a little bit trickier. It requires a very special vaporizer that has to be plugged in, the gas has to be heated, and it has a very high um, percentage that you have to use it at. So it's not big in practice yet. Halothane and foxyfluorine, hopefully nobody's using that anymore. Anybody using it? I can tell you my whole career I've never used halothane. I had opportunities to use it and I was like, oh, no thank you, I'm gonna go with the, the better products that are out there. Uh, the one thing that is not a halogenated hydrocarbon is nitrous oxide, which is sometimes used in practice. Anybody here have experience with nitrous oxide other than the <coughs> dentist office? Excellent. Nobody has. Wow. Okay. We won't talk about nitrous oxide that much then. So dangers of waste anesthetic gases. In the short term, you're going to feel nauseous, dizzy, headachey. Uh, you're going to feel tired around it, fatigued, and... When you hit all those together, you are going to be a little bit irritable. It's going to happen. You know, you know that smell. You can, you can just smell when the gas is leaking around the, the cuff or if you don't have a cuff inflated or you have a hole or leaking somewhere in your machine. The long-term exposures are usually going to affect the respiratory tract the most with sterility, miscarriages, birth defects. Um, the other birth defects happens a lot. Or does, I'm sorry, it doesn't happen a lot, but if you are chronically and you're in your first term of pregnancy, can have some effects on you. It has been known to cause certain cancers, one of which I not exactly, I can't tell you exactly which cancers it causes, but it has been linked to some cancers. Liver and kidney problems, and the one that's not documented that all of us in anesthesia feel like it happens is forgetfulness. Our memories are shot. It could just be that we do it so often, but that little bit exposure hasn't been documented. We walk into the room and go, why did I come in here? I'm sure a lot of you have felt that way over time, and it's not just from having children, it's not just from getting older, but we all think that it's a little bit of that exposure that we get every day. And going back to the birth, def or the, the reproduction side effects that it has, it's not just the women that are affected by it. If you read um, OSHA's website when they're talking about waste anesthetic gases and nitrous oxide, dental hygienist men, their families, their significant other partners have um, a residual effect from this, from what is on their clothes, what they are bringing home with them every day from using nitrous oxide in dental offices. So it's not just women who can be affected by this. So men, if you're there and thinking, oh, this is safe, I can take down because I'm protecting the women, it can stay on your clothes as well and you can bring it home and it can affect you as well. So how do we prevent the waste anesthetic gases from escaping out into our environment and everything? Well, you wanna make sure you have a proper ventilation system. You wanna make sure you have airflow moving through your hospital, proper storages of your, of your um, inhalants and the bottles and the boxes that they come in. You wanna make sure that they are properly stored and you want to have the functioning scavenging system in place, whether it be active or passive. Okay? So proper ventilation, they recommend that you have at least six room changes over an hour. 
So if this room was here and we were running anesthetic gases in here, you can hear the vents going up above. They want to make sure that the amount of air that's being pumped into the room and being sucked out of the room, that you're changing this air six times over an hour. Now places that you're going to have recovering areas or where patients are sitting in cages, you want to have it a little bit higher because they're breathing off that inhalant for quite some time afterwards. How many people have gone up to a dog that's recovering just to check on it? And it's been a half hour and you can still smell the isofluorine out of it. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of head nods. Yeah, so that's, those are the rooms that you want to have the even higher um, changeover. So you want to know where your air vents are located. Okay, and if you need to, you know, make sure that they're nice and clean. Um, if you need to, you're not sure what your room changes are or you're working out in a barn, you're doing some backwoods, uh, rural rabs trip, doing some, some spays and neuters out there, just put some additional box fans in. Those will really help to circulate the air and get those changes overs that you need. And they're fairly cheap. And you can get some small ones, prop them up in a window. Have, you know, if you have two windows in the room, put one in one window going out and one in one window facing in. So this way you are getting that circulation of air. The proper storage, know where your bottles are located. Don't have them in a spot where you're constantly reaching behind them to get something else because you can easily knock them off a shelf. They hit the floor, they break. I know a long time ago they used to make isofluorine in a glass bottle and a plastic on the outside. And those were great because those did break and it kept everything contained in the bottle. Why they don't do that, I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody's still using bottles like that. If you're getting it from a certain manufacturer now that they've lost their patent for the, for the ISO, which that disappeared years ago. Um, you want to make sure that it's not near a heat source. Obviously, you don't want it, a, a heater blowing right on them, causing some issues. And least likely to be abused where staff is around. So you get these high school kennel attendants, oh, I'm going to go sniff the isofluorine, and they're getting high and falling on the ground. It's not very good. That was the, uh, the biggest one is a lot, when a lot of practice had nitrous oxide in them, and they would come in the next morning and find the high school kennel attendant who had no experience and just wanted to get the, the thrill of having some nitrous oxide and not realizing that you need oxygen too with nitrous oxide and they would get hypoxic and unfortunately be a, a fatal situation when they walked in in the morning. So make sure that you know where everything is stored and know that it's not going to be able to get abused by staff. And know your staff that you're hiring as well. Okay. Active and passive scavenge. Just a Quick, how many people use an active scavenge that they know of? A couple of you. So most of you are using passive, and if you don't know the difference, active scavenge is the actual use of a mechanical means where it's got suctions and vacuums pulling things, literally pulling the waste anesthetics out of your machine and out into a different environment. Passive, exactly what it sounds like. There's no active mechanism pulling it out. It's just the airflow itself flowing down a long tube, whether it's going out the, the building itself in a separate port, out a window, or it's going into a fair canister. Here's what our active scavenge units look like. So we have this little cylinder here, and this is the actual vacuum that is sucking. This is coming from our, our bag, and that's going out. Uh, that one there is going out to the wall. This one's coming from the ventilator. And then we have it plugged right into the wall. So it's going out here, going through the ventilation system, out through the roof, and out of the building. And this right here is what we're going to be focusing on in the next slide. So that's called the thumb valve. And the thumb valve is used to adjust how much you're actually pulling out of the system. So over here, you can see that the, um, you have too much vacuum, that it's collapsing your rebreathing bag. So your patient goes to rebreathe, and there's nothing in this bag for them to pull from. This one here, your thumb drive, is, or your thumb valve is too low and it's not pulling enough and you can actually see that you're building up pressure in your rebreathing bag. This is the vacuum bag here. This is your rebreathing bag and you can see that it's, it's not high enough and you're having built up pressure in your machine which then could be built up pressure in your patient. Okay. These are that, what I pointed to on the screen. So this is telling me I have a great spot on between these white lines. I have just enough suction coming from my, my active scavenge that my bag should be 
pretty well inflated, not overly inflated, not too deflated, but they do get a lot of lint in them. So if you see that you're, you're turning it really high to get that ball to float, unscrew them and pull them off, you get little lint stuck in the bottom and stuck in that top portion to make sure that they're working appropriately. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the fair canisters, the activated charcoal canisters. These are the ones that are most common, common place practice. And the practice that I first started out with in general practice, as they mentioned many, many, many years ago, um, we had the hoses and they just came off our machine and they went through the concrete wall and out the building. And they had a little insulation around them too, but that's how they scavenged out all of their anesthetics. And that's fine to do. Waste anesthetics are, are much heavier than room air, so they're going to have a tendency to be down low where you may have a patient recovering on the floor, where you have that passed out person lying there next to that patient at the bottom of the waste anesthetic gases. So you've got to be all caught, conscious of everything that's going on. But then you can just take a long hose and run it to the basement and put some fans on in the basement, make sure that it's all, if you have that ability to run it to a basement. The activated charcoal canisters, you need to weigh these before you actually use them. How many people do practice that, weighing them and writing it down? Excellent, a bunch of you. Does anybody know what, why we weigh them? So you want to have a gain, anytime that it has a gain of 50 grams, then you know that it's, it's used up all of the activated charcoal in there. So if you don't weigh them and you just keep using them or you just mark down how much time you are, you've used on them, it's even possible that you've gone over your time. And I think that's kind of hard to see on here. Um, but there it does say, you know, use for 12 to 15 hours only with a buildup of 50 grams. So it's very important that you are weighing them. These, um, they don't absorb CO2. So it's just your waste anesthetic gases that they are building up. Some people say, you know, I've started to see I was getting a buildup in CO2 in my machine, so I changed out my ferro canister. No, that's not quite right. This only does the waste anesthetics. And most importantly, you need to have these laying on their side because they have their little vent holes directly on the bottom. So if you are going to be leaving them on a cart or something, make sure that they're in like a little cage so their vent holes can be on here, um, down on a gurney, laying completely flat, resting on a machine, but making sure that those vent holes at the bottom are completely exposed. Why? You do, why don't you want to leave them quite like that? Does anybody know? If the, the canister is laying completely flat on a counter, they can't <laughs> vent out and you can cause barotrauma. Anybody know what barotrauma is? Barotrauma is when I showed you those bags that was overinflated and it's causing buildup pressure in your, in your system, causing buildup pressure in your patient, it could lead to a pneumothorax. All of that pressure inside the chest those little alveoli start popping open and breaking and you can end up then with a pneumothorax and that's barotrauma, which is in the, in the chest cavity. You can actually hear the sound that it makes. It makes, if it's laying flat, you hear this and I was across the hall and I could hear this going on. I'm like, lay your fair canister flat. They're like, how did you know that? I'm like, it has a very distinct sound of all of that exhaled gas coming out and it rattling across the gurney, across the bottom of it. Okay, some other things that can happen. You have this laying there on the floor. Somebody pulls the anesthesia machine, pulls it up across the passive hose. Then you can have an increased buildup causing that barrel trauma again. Or simply somebody standing on it. Someone not, not noticing what's going on. Hey, what you got going on? It's a pretty cool spade out there. You got crazy uterus going on. And they're standing on the scavenging hose. Okay? So we're going to talk about pregnancy with waste anesthetic gases. Am I going too fast? Good? Okay. So if you can, just avoid it when possible. Obviously, these are our jobs. These are choices that we make. You can't always avoid being, being away from what we do from day to day. Healthy children can be born. It's not a problem. Just stating it again, it can cause sterility, miscarriages, birth defects. Um, like I said, just try to try to do to be diligent. You're not having your face right in front of the other patient. There are some precautions you can do. You can wear these great respirators. 
who wouldn't want to wear one of these every day? You have your own charcoal canisters there to, to uh, filter out all the waste anesthetics. But when you're wearing them, you sound like Darth Vader. You're very muffled and you're trying to, hey, I need atropine quick. Do you think that person can really understand you? These have to be um, fitted by a professional. Luckily for us here at the university, we have uh, our mental health and safety people that can do this for us. By contacting your doctors, they can give you a place of where you can go and get fit tested for these. Because if they're too big on you, the gas will just come in and around the mask. And if they're too small, again, it's not going to be very effective. Um, but they want to make sure that your oxygenation is staying up while you're wearing these. Because if you're getting hypoxic, it's not really good for your unborn baby. Baby gets hypoxic then. So since I've had my child and have had to wear that, they've now come out with these nice little charcoal filtered masks, which are a lot more comfortable. You can hear, you can understand people, and it's just like wearing a regular surgical mask. But that does have the charcoal filter, so you better be cautious of how long you're wearing it for. You change it in between cases so this way. If you do start to smell any inhalants, then you know that you've used up all of the charcoal that's in here. Just discard them and move on to the next one. These are, I saw a student wearing this and I was like, where did you get that? <laughs> that's lovely. Definitely much better than the Darth Vader mask. I mean, they are cool looking, but, okay. Um, precautions you can take. Also, just avoid filling the vaporizers. That is like the one time you really can't get away from the waste anesthetic gases. So, you know, don't be the one to fill the machines. Don't be the one to pressure check them. Pressure check them. Don't do the mask and tank inductions. If you do, even now, if I'm doing a SIVO tank induction, I will wear the mask because I am one of those people that can smell SIVO and it does affect me almost instantaneously. Like I, when I first started using it, I would instantly get a migraine. I'm like, I'm done for the day, I'm going home, folks. Now that I've been using it from time to time, it doesn't bother me as much. I can still smell it. I can still tell when somebody has a leak or there's just something not right with their system. It baffles people's minds when I can walk in the room and say, who's using SIVO? Mm -hmm. I am, check your machine, you've got a leak. And they're just like, how does she do that? It has, for me, it has a very distinct smell. So just avoid the mask and tank inductions if you can. Avoid recovering those patients. Because again, they're gonna be breathing out. You know, you wanna be holding them down, making them nice and warm. Keep your face away from their face. You know, it, it does help. Oh, I had a small leak. Um, how many people have the poor vaporizers that when you don't sh shut it tightly and then you turn on your ISO and it comes up like Old Faithful? Yeah, a couple of you do, you know, how that. It happens, it happens from time to time. Being diligent, checking your machine every time you use it will avoid those situations. Um, but just, you know, notify somebody if you know that they're nearby, that they are pregnant. It is helpful, you know, I know a lot of people don't like to tell when they're in that first trimester that they are pregnant, but it is helpful to tell your coworkers so they can help you avoid any situations that, that could put you at risk. And then if you just don't know, keep a fan running. Keep a fan running near you, keep the air moving past you. Uh, it does dissipate pretty quickly, but just so you are aware that, hey, there was a leak here, let's get the fan going. Everybody's safe. Okay? Now what happens when you have those spills? So, um, every spill should be handled with utmost, get it done, get it done quickly. Okay, whether it's large or small. Uh, every situation should be considered as a hazardous material or a hazmat situation. Again, regardless how big or how small. Make sure that they're getting quick, cleaned up as quick as possible. And again, quick response. Um, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Notify people, let them know. Not even just your staff members, but if you, are, you have a waiting room full of people, Make sure that you're closing off doors, um, windows, and making sure that it's not drifting out to you. Point all the fans out to the waiting room so your, your lovely client sitting out there all of a sudden become very dizzy and irritable. That's what you want to have happen. Small scale exposures, clean it up with a quick towel. Wrap the towel in a bag, plastic bag. Take that bag. If you want to save the towel, you don't have a lot of 
towels at your practice itself and you have your own washer and dryer, take the towel, take the bag, take it outside. Open the bag, let it vent outside, and make sure that everybody knows, hey, there's this bag here. So they're not going, what's this? And sticking their head right into that bag. Turn on, again, turn on additional fans. That is the most economic, economical way of getting rid of air quickly, just turning on a standard $10 box fan or an oscillating fan. And again, notifying any people, including if you don't want to tell the people out in the waiting room, you're all of your clients, but just you know, nice and nonchalantly close off those areas. Now, large scale, um, large scale exposures, as they're going to be your dropped bottles, um, a machine with a huge leak in it, you're going to want to call a hazmat team. You're going to call 911. Let them know I have a hazmat situation. I need um, a team over here to help us clean this out. So this team comes up, they're going to have full chemical protective wearing on, they're going to have their own air masks, they're going to clean up all those glass shards, they're going to clean up that room, they're going to vent that room, and they're going to do it as safe as they can. We did just have a student accidentally drop a SIBO bottle in one of our ORs. It was late at night, so they just put notes on the door. We do have a pretty good um, scavenging system in there. But then the cleaning staff may or may not have seen the note. It may or may, may or not have been gone at that point, but the hazmat team was not called. So we had to call them as soon as we got in the next morning and realized what was going on. And they went in with a little sensor. They're like, yep, the room is clear. But we may, um, the cleaning staff that we have may have been in contact with it and we don't know because they weren't, they did it at like two o'clock in the morning and this happened at like six o'clock at night. So hopefully everything was okay. But if you do have that big spill, you do want the people coming in with the protective gear to save yourself, save everybody else around you. Shut the doors, put towels under the doors if there's like a big gap so the air can't get out that way as well and seep out into the hallways. And again, just remember to keep in mind who is in your hospital. Okay, you may have that, you may have the basement where there's boarding facility down there. Make sure that that kennel attendant is aware because again, it is heavier than air so it will drift downstairs. So let's practice prevention. How do we prevent all of these leaks? How do we prevent all of these exposures? Um, everybody uses endotracheal tubes, yes? Everybody uses endotracheal tubes with uh, an inflated pilot balloon and a cuff, okay? How many people check their cuffs each and every time they're about to anesthetize a patient? A couple of you. I'm sure a bunch of you are like, oh, these are good. Okay, you get that dog who's waking up, or cat. Cats especially seem to wake up really quickly. And as they're pulling that tube out, they're already starting to chew. And what happens if a tooth makes a tiny little nick in the hose, in, a, in a, the balloon, and you don't know it, you go to use it on the next patient and it just keeps leaking on you. Oh, I keep smelling gas. Those are all those little exposures that we're trying to avoid. So check your tubes each and every time you go to do anesthesia. And inflating your cuffs, really should be a two-person operation. This should be done before any inhalants get on. You have your oxygen on, your tube is secure. You're gonna have one person, um, if you're using a non-rebreathing or even a, a rebreathing or non-rebreathing system, holding off the pop-off valve and squeezing the bag. This person has her ear right down to that patient. She's listening for air coming past the endotracheal tube. And when she hears that air going past, she starts inflating her cuff. And then when the air stops, she says, okay. And then the person here holding the, the bag with the pop-off clothes will say, yep, I'm holding, or no, I have a tiny little leak. If she says, no, I have a tiny little leak, she's gonna inflate just a little bit more until everybody's happy. And on the rebreathing systems, we try to do this at a 20 centimeters of water pressure. So this way, if for some reason you have a barrel, you have a, a somebody standing on the passive scavenge system, or you have a kink somewhere in that system, or you accidentally leave your pop-off shut, you have, it'll start leaking above 20 centimeters of water, and you can hopefully avoid that barrel trauma, okay? When moving a patient from one location to a next, put a set practice in. I'm gonna shut off my ISO, shut off my oxygen, give my bag a full squeeze with my pop-off open, empty out that bag, empty everything out, so usually most of it will go out to scavenging, some of it will go to the patient, let your patient exhale its breath, then disconnect. 
So if people who are like, oh, I never shut off my oxygen until after I pass, after I disconnect my patient, so I disconnect and then shut off my oxygen, there's still isofluorine running through your machine. So even though that's just those split seconds of taking it off and then shutting off your oxygen, you still have some running through your machine and escaping out into the room. Okay? People like me who do anesthesia all the time, we really try to cut down on our risks of any exposure that we have. So we shut off our oxygen, ISO, squeeze out the bag, and then disconnect. When a patient is waking up, keep them hooked up to oxygen that whole time. One, because it's going to scavenge out everything that they're breathing off until that tube is out. Two, I'm sure a lot of you may have patients that get cold, and when they're waking up, they're shivering. Anybody know what shivering does with oxygen? It increases oxygen demand 400%. So you have a patient shivering, they can get, start to get a little hypoxic. So by supporting them with oxygen, you're doing better by the patient. So keeping them hooked up to the breathing system the whole time until they're extubated. Then once they're extubated, it's not much we can really do about it. Yes, they're still gonna be breathing it off. Don't put your face right in their face. Filling vaporizers at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. How many people have all of their staff in the first thing all at once? Not many. People start trickling in slowly in the morning and again at the night. Like if you know you're the last one doing treatments in your practice, you're the last one checking on the patients from the spays or neuters that day. Once everybody else is gone and it's just you, go around, fill your vaporizers. Make sure there aren't a lot of people around so they're breathing off that waste on acetic acids. Avoiding those tank and mask inductions. Yes, I know you're dealing with a lot of feral cats that you may not be able to touch or anything. So putting them in a cage, you get this happy little critter here. Putting them, actually that is a very nice, it was a, all photoshopped for that, but it's a very nice cat, but still, you're putting them in there, you're dumping out a bunch of oxygen um, and isofluorine or sevofluorine in there. Make sure you have a great scavenging system, nice tight seal. These old aquarium tanks were great for that. But when you pull that, that top off, all of that anesthetics that are in size, making Kitty nice and sleepy, they dump out into the room. Turn on a box fan before you even take that top off. Take the top off, quickly move it to another location. Have somebody there who can quickly move it out of the room where everybody's standing and inducing that patient, having a box fan going on in there, closing off a door, putting it in a separate room. The only problem is Kitty has all this fur, all that anesthetic, is still within Kitty's fur too. Throw a blanket over Kitty. Let it escape differently that way. Let it push it down to the floor and away from your faces. Okay? You can, some people will, like I said, I usually will still wear a respirator while I'm doing a tank induction. We do them so few and far in between, which is great. But rubbing that, that Kitty's fur, get, loosening it up, getting it out, throwing a towel over it, that's gonna, it's gonna help. Okay. Keeping your vents clear. How many people have dust covered all over their vents and everything? And these places that you go into, you're using somebody else's facility for a day. Pull out the vacuum, clean off those ceiling fans. This will be your, the intake on the floor. That's where the air is coming down from the ceiling. Make sure that those are nice and clean. This really isn't that dirty. It's just rust from being cleaned constantly. They, they get old after a while. Um, but having those dust free really does help. So you gotta know where all of your vents are outside of your building. If you're working in a practice and you're there every day, um, be mindful of where they, and know where they are venting out of your building. You have somebody working on your roof, <laughs> you don't want them getting dizzy and falling off because they're standing right next to your waste anesthetic gases where they're pumping out of the building and everything. How many people use um, monitors, especially end tidal CO2 monitors? A couple of you, good. So uh, we have these ones here, which are a nice little side stream, nice little 78 end tidal. Somebody must have had a propofol induction and took a long time to start breathing again. But it also has this little button here. These side stream ones pull the actual gases out of the system to test for your CO2. And they have this little thing here, which then pops all of your waste anesthetic gases out there. So make sure you get it capped and somehow going to your, if you have active scavenge or um, your passive scavenge, if you need to try and make a 
MacGyver a little port to go to your passive scavenger well, but make sure that these are also venting out and being uh, appropriately taken care of. We've had, to have some people, and that's how a couple of times I've actually walked into a room and smelled SIBO, is because somebody didn't have their side stream being vented out correctly. Checking your machines all over for leaks. This will include hoses, bags, soda absorb containers, any connections. Over time, these things start to get weak, they start to get dried out, and they start to crack. That could be a source of a leak. Um, soda absorb, when you're check pressure checking machine, you've just changed your soda absorb and you still can't get your machine to hold by pressure checking it. You can see I've got bubbles coming out of here and that's because I have a nice small leak from that, that spot. Um, I don't know how many people have fancy SPO, or I'm sorry, oxygen sensors that pop onto their machines. That's, if that's not popped in tightly, that could be a source of a leak. And right here, your hose isn't on all the way. Whether you're trying to do something quickly or you bumped it, but that also can be a source of a leak. Make sure that those are positioned on tightly. Snoop, it's a recommended brand for doing um, all of your leak testing. We have been told in the past, this is the only thing that we use, that soapy water. I know a lot of practice will just uh, put some water in and it's a little bit of Dawn dish soap. Um, Sometimes there can be a chemical reaction in there that could make things go boom when you use straight soapy water, what we've been told by the guy who checks all of our machines for us. So he said, don't, don't use soapy water anymore, but to use this snoop. And we all know something going boom and having an oxygen source right there makes a bigger boom that we want to avoid. Uh, routine machine maintenance, having it done yearly this is the Bible of all anesthesiologists is Dorsch and Dorsch. Dorsch and Dorsch talks about all anesthetic machines and equipment. And they have a list in there of how things should be checked, when they should be checked, what orders they should be checked, and create, helping you create a checkoff list of how things should be done, when they should be done. So we're all familiar with our types of breathing systems, yes? We have our standard semi-closed rebreathing system with the Y pieces, the one-way valves, different sizes bags. Does anybody use the pediatric and an adult circuit? A couple of you, great. We, it's very rare that we actually use a non-rebreather system in our practice now, even small cats, small dogs, we use the pediatric system on. We're not seeing a lot of dead space ventilation with them, which is great. And the non-rebreathers, how many people use the Bain system that looks like this? None of you? Okay. And then we have the modified Jackson Reese. Does this look more familiar with people? Okay, you have your pressure relief valve. This would be your pop-off valve here. This is where your oxygen and isofluorine are coming in. This is where it connects and attaches to your patient. And here's your, active, or your passive scavenge that can either stay passive or you can then hook to your active scavenge machine. So the big difference between the, the rebreathers and the non-rebreathers all have to do with those one-way valves as well. So the rebreathing system lets air pass through your machine a couple of times. The non-rebreather does not. So the semi-closed, this is your rebreathing system. It only requires 20 mils per kilo of oxygen demand. So when you're calculating for a patient, say you have a mixed breed 20 keg dog, you read your oxygen demand is only, uh, what, 400, 400 mils per minute. So as you're shed, setting your flow on your oxygen demand, so you're not wasting a lot of oxygen, you only have to set it for like half a liter. Okay. Requires a soda lime, which can be a little bit costly, but that's what is used to remove all the CO2 from the system. It can have that increased dead space, which I was showing you with those Y pieces in the previous slide. And it's a lot easier to do controlled ventilation if your patient's not breathing, to assist in ventilation, and to do CO2 monitoring. Now your non-rebreathers, this is where it can get costly, is that they have a 200 mil per kilo demand. And that's to push that CO2, that exhaled gases, back up the system and out. And they're not rebreathing it back in. It doesn't have to use the CO2, um, the, the sodasorb because it's not 
picking up the CO2 and rebreathing it back in so you don't have to pull that out of your system. The good thing about non-rebreathers is any size patient can breathe on them. Okay, so now you've got that, say you get a Great Dane in who's pushing 50 kgs. At 200 mils per minute, per kg per minute, you're looking at almost 10 liters just to make sure that a 10 liter flow per minute, making sure that you're getting all that exhaled gas pushed back up your machine. Okay, if you're running on an oxygen tank, that gets depleted pretty quickly. So it gets pretty costly. So that's why a lot of people like to use their non rebreathers on patients that weigh 15 pounds and less because of this 200 mil per kg um, per minute demand. Okay. Unfortunately, they do break very easily, and this is the one number one rule, one of the number one reasons why we don't use them anymore is because they do break easily, and they can be attached incorrectly and can be fatal. We've had a lot of people not hook up the fresh gas flow. They actually, like, hook it back into the machine, so they're not actually getting oxygen, and it ha we had um, some, close, some close calls if they weren't caught quick enough. So they were being hooked up incorrectly, can be fatal, so a lot of our chiefs said, no more. We're not using them anymore, and we've gone to the pediatric systems. A lot of people say because it's a tube inside of tube that those exhaled gases are a little bit warmer, that it does help to keep the patient warmer. Um, but you're also using a pretty high gas oxygen flow, and oxygen is so cold in and of itself. So it is controversial whether or not it does help to keep the patients warmer. It does help to warm the air that the patient's breathing in. So you want to be checking your hoses for cracks, leaks. This here is the inside portion right here. I actually had this happen to me, that inside portion cracked. I took a patient, we we're going down to our CT machine. Hoses were hanging nicely outstretched and everything. Patient did great, we did CT. I put him back in the cart and I happened to coil the hoses around itself. My patient was turning blue, was waking up. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I'm like, well, he could breathe fine before he was asleep. I'm done with my procedure anyways. I woke him up. We got back. We cut open this tube, and lo and behold, there was a tiny little crack inside there that when it was coiled around, it was opening up. And of course, it's up here where the fresh gas flow is, and my patient's down here breathing, so all of this became dead space on a cat. So they do get weak, they do break easily. Why pieces, if they're getting jammed on the tubes too tight, these little inner things, the inner piece here, can get cracks in them, and you don't see that right away. So be, checking, be very vigilant in checking your, your pressures, uh, your, your hoses and everything for cracks. So we're gonna go through exactly how to pressure check a machine. You may notice the person in the video. Yes, that is myself, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to occlude one end with a stop cock, or you can either use your finger. I don't really like using my palm of my hand. I don't feel like it gives me a good enough hold. So I'm increasing pressure in my machine, holding it between 30 to 40 centimeters of water. You can hear this beeping coming from here. That's telling me that I'm holding pressure, that I'm exceeding what is safe for a patient. Letting it, making sure it holds for about five seconds. And then again, I scavenge everything out of that bag before I walk away. Because if, if I didn't, I could make sure that I could forget my pop-off is closed. So I make sure the pop-off is closed, squeezing out that bag. So you do want to hold it between 30 to 40 centimeters of water pressure, and you want to make sure it holds for five seconds. So if you have a machine that's leaking ah, pretty fast, you want to investigate. You want to see where it's coming from. But if this holds and it goes, and it just ever so slowly starts to lose pressure, that is acceptable, it's deemed acceptable. But you really just wanna see it stay there and not go anywhere else for about five seconds. Okay, so now we're gonna be testing those vein circuits. We have it hooked up to fresh gas. Once you have taken your fresh gas flow out of your machine and hooked it to your vein system, this whole portion, the soda absorb, the, pop, the, the peep pressure, all of this is now null and void. It's just standing there as an, as an open appendage. So you're not gonna have that gauge to see. You're just gonna be feeling the bag, okay? So the pop-off is within the bag up here. I'm checking, making sure everything is connected correctly. I'm connected to scavenge. So again, I hold, include one end 
occlude the pop off valve. Just use a little bit of O2, make sure my bag is well inflated. I give it a little test. I'll test it again. And then once I know that I'm satisfied, I'm not hearing any leaks coming around, a little hole that's in the bag, making sure everything is happy, I then squeeze out my bag and walk away. And I know that it's all good. Now remember we had, I showed you that, that crack on the inside hose. How are we going to check for that? How, besides slicing the whole thing open and then ruining the system, this is a way of checking for it. Come on. Is this one not going to play? Everything else played? I guess this one's not playing. So um, what I'll do is I'll still hook up the fresh gas flow to the, to the one portion of it, and then I'll put a tiny adapter. At the, at the end, there's a little spike that sticks out, and I'll hook the adapter, a plastic adapter, onto that, and then hook that back into um, the fresh gas line of the machine. So you can see here, there is the, like a tree, um, Christmas tree adapter. So I'll hook this bottom portion to the fresh gas intake on it, and then I'll hook a tiny adapter and go back into this one. And then again, I'm able to use this gauge here. I close the pop off, um, hold the pop off closed and turn on the oxygen. I don't know why this one, of all three, this one's not playing. But it's a simple way of checking that inner line. Um, if people want to email me, I'll be able to explain it a little bit easier than just showing you pointing with the, the laser pointer on here. I apologize for that. Okay, so timetables for when you want to make sure that your machines are checked and have maintenance done. You want to make sure it has them yearly. Have all of your machines professionally maintained and calibrated yearly. Make sure that you know, you're traveling with these machines, going to different places to set up RAVs trips, to, to be doing um, spays and neuters at other clinics. If you're traveling with your machines, it can get jostled a lot. Isofluorine can, can move around within that vaporizer and it can get uncalibrated. So Russ uh, is a private, privately contracted out. Um, he goes to many facilities within central New York. I, get, I asked for his permission to put his card up. He comes and checks our machines along with some of our people from EHS. But if he has issues, he will service our machines yearly to make sure that everything's working adequately, that there's no, the internal um, compartments, there's no cracks or wear and tear inside of them as well. Monthly, checking all of your hoses for weak spots. Um, I showed you that one slide that had the, the crack and the fresh gas flow being connected in, that they're not getting dry, uh, dry rot, um, cracks going from our scavenge into our active scavenge. Checking all of your end tidal, your tracheal tubes, get them all out, make sure you have all the sizes that you want available to you. Checking their cuffs, making sure that they hold pressure. Even take those tubes and stick them under water because as, you, as you're sitting them out in air, there's not a lot of extra pressure on them, but when you have them in a trachea, the trachea can kind of conform to them and it puts a little bit of pressure on them and that can cause some little leaks. So if you're putting them in water, the water acts as the out external pressure on them and you can also check and see if they're bubbling anywhere. Uh, we had one just recently bubbling out of the pilot, uh, the, the balloon that you're actually inflating to go down to the cuff, the little pilot balloon that's there where you hook up your syringe that was leaking at a connection in there had gotten weak. So weekly, check all of your tanks, your oxygen tanks. If you're working on a wall system that pumps in your oxygen directly, but you have some tanks that are there just as a backup in case your compressor for your oxygen fails, uh, making sure that those tanks are full. And this way, if you need to reorder them, you can. Checking your soda sorbs, making sure that they're not getting purple at the top. The one practice I worked at, um, one of our kennel attendants was helping us out and he was changing soda soap for us. He's like, I can't find the purple ones. I can only find the white ones. And I'm like, yeah, the purple ones are bad. I mean, he, was, he was a kennel attendant. He didn't go to school. He didn't know that purple means bad. So he was looking for the purple soda sorb instead of the white soda sorb. I'm like, no, no, white is what we want. Making sure that these are getting weighed. Um, I do help out with the MRI unit down campus uh, with um, the Martha Van Rensselaer MRI. 
And the guys that work there are very vigilant about weighing these each and every time, and they write it down so they know when they are getting too full and need to be changed. So daily, check those machines each and every time that they are used. Make sure that you're having ISO. Make sure that you're, if somebody said, oh, this is getting low on ISO, came over, filled it in between your space, walked away. Make sure that that port is closed. And so you close off your system and you're not having any leaks. Check all of your, check your inhalants, check your O2 levels, check your tank, make sure that it's still floating and that your pressure is in the right spot. Making sure that the soda sorb isn't very purple or inching its way down in the canister. Check your activated charcoal. Okay. Check, I can't stress this enough, we have a checklist that we make our students do each and every case that we do. Now we run roughly 15 cases a day and I'm sure some, if you're doing spays and neuters, you're out doing SOS, they're running a lot more cases than that. Not all of them are on inhalants, but I can't stress enough checking your machine each and every time that, that they are used. Okay, any questions? Great. Thank you very much, thank you for having me.